So uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I want to welcome everybody from, from Miami. Hello from Washington, D.C. Typically, this is the time of season of year that I get to travel, typically to all of you, but I'm here in Washington, and um, I wish I was with all of you. I'm Liz Schreyer. I'm the president and CEO of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, and I want to begin with my deepest thoughts and prayers to anyone who yourself or your family has been impacted by the COVID-19 virus. I hope all of you are healthy and well and your families are as well. I'm so pleased to be joined by all of our activists and supporters from the Miami area to what I think will be a really important conversation to talk about America's role in the world, our role in the world, particularly in the midst of COVID-19 and why leading local, globally matters locally. And obviously the fact that we are talking through a platform of our Zoom platform really kind of says it all. We are very lucky to have a virtual town hall conversation with somebody you all know well, and that's of course your Congresswoman, Donna Shalala, who uh, knows this issue quite well, and we're gonna join, be joined by somebody who, if you don't know, you're gonna get to know is a real expert in this area, national security expert, and that's General Douglas Fraser. I'm gonna introduce them both to you very shortly. You can't see them right now, but they are in the Zoom room, and I'm gonna introduce them. But first, a couple quick logistics. You are all on mute, but I'm gonna unmute you as you get to ask questions in just a little bit. There's a couple different ways that you're gonna to get to ask questions. If you're joining by, um, by your computer or your iPad, there is a icon that uh, has participant. You can actually raise your hand and I'll get to see that. If you're joining by, you can actually ask your questions by a Q&A icon down at the bottom when we get to that part. Or if you're joining by phone, you can hit star nine and that's how I'll be able to see that you are asking a question. Um, before we get started with our conversation between our two guests, I'm just going to say a couple words about the context of our discussion. You know, USGLC, your host for today, started and was formed 25 years ago. And when I think back, it is certainly the world is quite changed quite dramatically since 25 years ago. We were formed at the end of the Cold War. So think about that now. We had won. Uh, some of our fellow citizens thought, we should have a peace dividend. We don't need to be involved in the world. We could pull back. We could pull back and don't need things like the State Department, USAID, our Peace Corps. Some of us, like myself, thought that that's very dangerous and we should organize. We should make sure that we stay engaged in the world. And that is that organization is your host for today. That's the big tent known as we are often called the Strange Bedfellow Coalition. We are now 500 businesses and NGOs, groups and companies like Coca-Cola, Walmart, Google, World Vision, Care, Save the Children, all these icons you are seeing up on the screen in front of you. We are bipartisan and very proud of that. Our advisory committee is kind of the who's who in national security and foreign policy. Many of the former living secretaries of state, secretaries of defense, we have over 200 retired three and four star generals. You're gonna meet one of them today, General Frazier. And we live in every state, including Florida, and our guest of honor, uh, Congressman Shalala, actually chaired our Florida Advisory Committee for so many years. And what brings us together is exactly what we're gonna talk about today, that America needs to lead in the world, not only because it's the right thing to do, but frankly, it's the smart thing to do because it affects our security, our economic interests, and our values. What we do with that is we hold forums like we're gonna to do today, why investments in global health, global development, and diplomacy matters. And we advocate. We advocate for a little 1% of the federal budget. It's known as the international affairs budget. A lot of people think it's just foreign aid, but it's really quite more than that. And we're gonna talk about that today, about why it helps for our diplomats around the world, our healthcare workers, programs that open up our markets for our goods and services. So with that as some background, let me introduce our two speakers and get the conversation going. You're going to meet General Doug Frazier. He served in the Air Force for over 37 years, capping his career as the commander of U.S. Southern Commander by the year 2012. At that time, he knows a lot about the conversation we're going to talk about because he led DOD during the relief effort in Haiti after the 2010 earthquake. 
He also held many numerous positions, including deputy commander at the U.S. Pacific Command. And as I already mentioned, he serves on the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition's National Security Advisor, Advisory Council. He's going to be joined by somebody you all know well. That's Congresswoman Donna Shalala serving as the, uh, the Congresswoman in Florida's 27th District. Already you see her all over the news because no one understands the issue of global health better than Congressman Donna Shalala. As she has often said, she may be a, a, a freshman on Congress, but she is no rookie because as you know, she was Secretary of Homeland, uh, of not Homeland, of, of HHS, uh, sorry about that, um, under Bill Clinton, President of University of Miami, led the Clinton Global Initiative, who is one of the most innovative when it comes to infectious diseases, she, she, fighting infectious diseases, and served a year ago, and we're going to talk about this, on a commission that looked at how do we get ahead on global health security agenda. And as I said, near and dear to my heart is led our effort in Florida. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome our two guest speakers, General uh, Frazier and Congressman Donna Shalala. Welcome to you both. Everybody can see you now. How are both of you and how are both of your families? We're just fine Congresswoman. Um, down here in South Florida. Um, I'm as frustrated as everybody is uh, about not being able to get out and run around. But uh, these Zoom meetings have been tremendous in terms of the number of people that we can bring together and we can help actually. I feel more like a local government official now because um, I'm used to bringing the policy uh, back and leaving it to local government people, but we're asking, answering telephones, letters, emails, very detailed questions uh, about programs that will help people. Um, and having a Great. broader discussion is very useful because we can't lose sight of the rest of the world. Great. And, and General Frazier, welcome to you as well. You're, you're well, I hope. Uh, yes, I'm well. Uh, it's great to be back uh, in South Florida virtually. Uh, I spent six years down there before moving up uh, to the other side of uh, Florida. Uh, but fortunately, the family's all doing well. So I'm really excited to be back in South Florida. Wish I could be there uh, in person. Uh, but times uh, are slowing that opportunity down. Well, you're always welcome, Jeff. Great. Thank you very much. Well, let's get into the conversation. I'm going to ask a bunch of questions to the two of you, and then we'll open it up. And I'm going to start, Congressman Shalala, with you. And I'm actually going to start by showing you a 30 second uh, clip that frankly, I wish all of us had paid attention to, you did, but the rest of us did. And I'm gonna ask you a question on the other side of it. So ladies and gentlemen, take a look at this. Today, the greatest risk of global catastrophe doesn't look like this. Instead, it looks like this. If anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus rather than a war. Not missiles, but microbes. Now, part of the reason for this is that we have invested a huge amount in nuclear deterrence. But we've actually invested very little in a system to stop an epidemic. We're not ready for the next epidemic. So, Congressman and Shalala, that was Bill Gates in 2015. You know that because you've been singing off that same song sheet throughout your entire career. You just got off a CSIS commission called the Global Health Security Agenda, where you talked about how 70% of the world's health systems are not capable of predicting or responding to a pandemic. So without blame, without part pointing, how in the world did we get here where we weren't ready? Congresswoman. Well, we've never been able to make that case so that there have been serious investments of making that case. We did a little bit when we saw Ebola, when we saw uh, the hantavirus, uh, and obviously when we saw AIDS, but they were narrow um, kinds of investments. What, what Bill Gates is really talking about is the infrastructure, the public health infrastructure. Every time I talked about that in the 1990s and talked about the possibility of a pandemic, at that time we were talking about a more flu-like uh, pandemic, and that's what he was talking about, um, uh, people's eyes glazed over. 
the idea of investing in public health. And by the way, what we're talking about were investments in state and local health departments, in laboratories, in the CDC, um, in the National Institutes of Health, in the FDA. And it was just tough. And it was tougher to make the, the case that this was a national security issue. I remember in the 1990s, early on, going to a conference that President Ford had, he was the ex-president at the time, in Colorado, in which I actually, they set me up in a debate with Gene Kirkpatrick. And the question was, is health a national security issue? And I used AIDS to argue it was in fact a national security issue. I actually came back from there and embedded a CDC person in the National Security Council. The only reason they took the person was uh, number one, he was ex-military, and number two, um, I was paying for it. But we actually put a health, a pandemic leader in the NSC at that time. We did desktop things. Uh, we actually had a strategy for dealing with pandemics in which we got some investment, but only by going to the defense appropriations committees, because they were far more interested than the health committees at the time. So I want to get to national security, but I want to ask you one more question before getting General Frazier in there about looking forward. So one of the things you and I have often talked about is, is this conversation about why leading global, globally matters so much locally and how to get the American citizens to actually care about this. So we actually just did a poll and we went out and asked the American public, does this matter? And so I want to see how well your constituents can guess how, where, the, where the American public is right now. So there's actually a function for those of you who are joining by computer uh, that, that is a poll and I'm gonna ask you to guess. So this is a question we actually asked the American public and all of you can, can actually go on your computer. So this is a question, see how well you know what the American public says. What percentage of voters think that as long as coronavirus is spreading anywhere in the world, we won't be safe from new outbreaks here in the US? Do you think 15% agree with that statement of American voters, 35% agree with that statement, or 50% or 77? Everybody vote. You can just pick up, you just, you put your uh, mouse on one of those. And then Emily, let's see how Donna, uh, Congresswoman Shayla's vote. So 77, you are right. Your, your, your constituents are correct. Almost 80% of Americans right now believe that we can't be safe unless unless that uh, we are connected to the rest of the world. So Congresswoman, here's my question for you. You are gonna go back to Congress at some point in the next couple of weeks, and there is gonna be another supplemental, and obviously we have to focus on lots of things domestically, but we better focus on the international piece as well. What's your case to them about why now we have to focus internationally? Well, we can see it in front of us. The, um, this disease doesn't know where it is. It's an international, it, it crosses borders. And if, if we don't stop it in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, in Europe, uh, we won't be safe here in the United States. Um, and so we have a responsibility um, uh, to, uh, to this country. It's in our self-interest to make those investments. And luckily, the chair of appropriations, Nita Lowy, actually holds that budget herself. She has not, there is not a separate chair of the State Department, the aid budget. The chair, Nita Lowy, holds it herself because she's so concerned about this issue. And from the moment uh, that the Democrats took over uh, the Congress and she became the chair as opposed to the ranking member, she also has a ranking member, Kay Granger, that believes in these in investments in this area. So this is a bipartisan issue in Congress, in the House of Representatives uh, in particular. And all, all the uh, COVID-19 does is reinforce what we've been all arguing. We weren't ready, uh, but the, these investments are critical to our survival. We're talking about life or death. This is not an isolated virus. 
So let's do a lightning round about what's at risk for us not to be engaged in the world. And, and this can go broader than just COVID-19. This is just, as you said, is a window into kind of exacerbating problems that you've been talking about. And I want to start with national security, hit economic climate, as many issues as we can, and then we'll open it up. So um, national security, General Frazier, already we're seeing the military talk about how COVID-19 is exacerbating all kinds of national security issues. Military is talking about how this is bringing back a spread of resurgence of ISIS in Syria. We're seeing migration um, in, uh, into other fragile states, destabilization in, in Northern Triangle. Um, what's keeping you up at night as you see COVID-19 spreading and exasperating national security issues? And then I, I want to come back to, 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 to you, Representative Shalila, on this. Yeah, I would say the thing that keeps me up most at night is, first of all, the readiness of our forces. Uh, because you see that the, the COVID-19 is impacting our forces. Our, our leadership is taking very proactive stance to deal with the situation, but it's going to be one of those issues that's going to remain with us as our forces continue to maintain uh, their readiness. The second thing I have uh, that keeps me up at night is much what you talked about. It's where organizations who see an opportunity based on the insecurity that happens uh, economically, socially, uh, as a result of the virus. And, and so that instability provides groups uh, with the opportunity to take advantage of it. Uh, I, I don't know exactly where that's going to be, where that's going to uh, hit biggest. You mentioned a couple with ISIS, with migration, uh, but I think there's going to be other challenges uh, that we find also from, as you mentioned, economic and social. Uh, so those are the two really key issues uh, that I'm concerned about. Uh, and our forces are engaged throughout the world. Uh, that's on a positive, uh, and I, you know, much as we've talked about diplomacy, development, and defense all go hand in hand. We can't separate uh, any of those. General, if I could ask you a question, Hi. is social distancing possible in America's military, given that they live and work in close quarters? Uh, I think it depends on what you're talking about and where you are. Uh, so in certain circumstances, uh, specifically with the Navy living on ships, it's much harder. And so the ability to contact trace, though, is much higher, uh, I would argue. So there are some regimens uh, that I know that military leaders are putting in place uh, to deal with the specific situation that they find themselves in with and, and mitigating the circumstances to the best of their ability. Congressman, let me ask you one of the looming national security issues that I think is another one that has gotten exacerbated, and that is the issue of climate. You're sitting in a, I'm looking at the background that you have. Miami is one of the most vulnerable coastal cities in the world. It is not alone. There are so many of them. How do you see the whole climate issue in, in light of these growing complexities that we're seeing happening throughout the world? Well, one of the things is that we've been wanting to do a big infrastructure bill and to invest in things that we need here in South Florida, building um, seawalls, uh, pumps. Uh, there are a lot of things that we want to deal with uh, down here. And the allocations we've made until now are not taking that into account. We're about to do a bill that will include substantial money for state and local government. And I think that will help to offset some of the costs uh, that we have. Here's a couple of things though. The air is cleaner because less people are out. Yeah, yeah. So we've got, uh, we certainly have uh, cleaner air, but how long that will last. But those environmental issues stretch right down into La Central and Latin America, um, to Haiti and Puerto Rico. And, and unless those places are safe, and um, then we, it will be difficult for us to uh, deal with our own uh, challenges. But uh, in terms of air quality, there are two things we found out about staying at home. Number one, air quality is much better uh, all over the United States. But number two, in South Florida, we're using more water because people are at home. Uh, home, yeah. Look, I'm running my dishwasher more than I ever have 
in my home. <laughs> and Doing I'm more laundry, life. everything. Yep. Yes. Um, so very um, good point. There are a number of things that are going on, but we want to continue to make investments in infrastructure. And my hope is somewhere in the next couple of months, we're going to have a big stimulus bill that's related to infrastructure right. that deals with the uh, that deals with the environment. So on my, my lightning round, we talk national security, climate. Let me talk about you, about um, economics. So the health crisis, there's also obviously an economic crisis. And I want to go global again. Obviously, we could talk a lot about domestic. But let me put it in a global context. 30 million unemployed here. But IMF is talking about a global economic decline of 3% this year. But Florida is so interconnected with trade, you know, two and a half million jobs connected. The number of international exporting companies is probably as large as any one per capita in the country. The emerging markets are such an important part of the trade relationship between Florida. And they were stressed before COVID-19. And the stress factor is going to be even more. The G20 IMF have already announced the spending debt relief temporarily, maybe it may extend it. So starting with you, uh, Congressman Shalala, how, how are you seeing how important it is for the U.S. to play a leadership role, not only on the health side, but also on the economic side when these countries are going to collapse economically? What's your thought on that? That we have to do what we can to stabilize, uh, particularly the international economic organizations uh, whether it's the IMF or the World Bank, these places, we may have to eliminate debt. Uh, we may have to ask them not only to put it off, but actually to eliminate debt uh, during this period. And the last thing we can do is not invest in the UN organizations, whether it's refugee relief or whether it's uh, a WHO, whether it's UNICEF. Uh, at the end of the day, we're going to need that infrastructure not only for spreading treatment and, and vaccines, but um, we're creating other kinds of challenges uh, around the world. And then our advisory role uh, in terms of uh, the military, the general can talk about that. Uh, I'd hate to see us pull back uh, from that as well, as well as the kind of investments we're making to rebuilding um, infrastructure in uh, much of the world. And we're a partner. We're not doing this alone. We're a partner. And right. the Europeans are stepping up, um, as, is, um, as are some of the Asian countries, and we have to step up as well. So that's a question I want to ask General Frazier. So something you know well from your days in Southcom is China is out there. China is out there. They're now the largest tra trader for, than us over us in Brazil, for example. Um, so they, you know, we can argue and talk about what they did or didn't do in terms of the whole beginning of the coronavirus. They're in 120 countries in terms of providing PPE and support. Um, how concerned are you about China from a national security and economic point of view? You both may have comments, but General Frazier, kick that one off. And then I want to hit one more uh, area before we, we open it up to, to the audience. General yeah, I'm worried about China. And uh, just from my times at, in U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, uh, I've been watching the development of China for over 20 years now and, and how they've gone out and engaged in the world. And let me bring it home to the Western Hemisphere. Uh, oftentimes, I think we take as a nation the Western Hemisphere and the safety and security of the Western Hemisphere for granted. Uh, China has come in very strong uh, into Latin America, the Caribbean, Central America, uh, with investment. As you look at the Belt and Road, you can look at some of the internet and some of the 5G uh, issues. And I know that's a big issue on the administration, but from my standpoint, if you look at what a lot of internet companies have done, it's all about the data. Uh, and so from my standpoint, what that infrastructure provides is access to unbelievable amounts uh, of data, which then give China economic diplomatic advantages uh, in international forums. Uh, so they are Belt and Road initiatives. They are still very, very engaged uh, around the world. And let me 
uh, and, and within Latin America. But let me bridge also to your climate issue with another concern with China and go to a different part of the world than we normally think about in, in Florida and South Florida, and that's the Arctic. Uh, climate change is changing the Arctic. And, and if you look at the potential for opening sea routes through the Arctic and what that means for the United States, and, and there's some key strategic territory up off of Alaska in the Bering Strait and the Bering Sea. Uh, so I think we need to look at this on not just a regional basis, but on a global basis and, and understand uh, the broad impact uh, that China is having on the world. Um, let me do one more round on, on kind of the, the reality is about the, the horrific humanitarian consequences. I read a report about that was done by the International Rescue Committee. They looked at 34 conflict and fragile countries and projected that we could be looking at a billion people, this is kind of the calm before the storm, a billion people that could be infected in the next, you know, in the next few months or so, and 3.2 million deaths. So the, the, uh, the, the, the challenge could be extraordinary. I'm going to do one more poll and then ask a question, Representative Shalala. So look down at your polling screen, everybody. And here's the question for you. Um, as a result of the food crisis, we're not just looking at a health crisis. We could be looking at a food crisis brought on by the pandemic. What percentage increase could we see in the number of people at risk of starvation in the world? Could we be looking at a 30% increase, a 50% increase, or a 100% increase? This is something that a number of people are looking at. Take a vote. All right, let's see how everybody voted. So your constituents are suggesting there could be a 50% increase. Well, let me share with you what the head of the World Food Program is saying. He is predicting a 100% increase. David Beasley, the head of the World Food Program, believes that he is calling multiple fam famines of biblical proportions. He thinks we are looking at 265 million more at risk a year. Congressman Shalala, I'm gonna pick, ask you to look at one country, though you may wanna talk about more, a country that you've been watching for years, Venezuela. You have traveled right to the border. That's just one example of so many that we're so worried about. Um, talk for a moment about how you are concerned about what is happening just to the humanitarian side of this crisis around the world. You could, you could talk about Venezuela, though you can pick probably so many places you've traveled. You've traveled to Africa. You've traveled literally all over the world, um, but, but right in our own hemisphere. How concerned are you? I'm very concerned about Venezuela, and because this is added to the humanitarian crisis that already existed, um, in Venezuela, and we've had great difficulty getting aid humanitarian into the country because um, the illegitimate uh, leadership, uh, the Maduro uh, regime has denied much access. I think the Red Cross has been in for a little bit, but now the shortage of medicines, which already existed, and the shortage of any kind of relief for the hospitals uh, with or without uh, treatment or a vaccine is just an absolute disaster. But we're going to see this all over the world. This is not, and, and Venezuela yeah. is a very acute example uh, of this, and I'm very worried. But I'm also worried about places where Venezuelans have gone, the millions that have been absorbed in, in Colombia, in Peru, in northern Brazil, um, and who are living um, in desperate situations, who are, are already adding to the burden of those countries uh, in particular. So uh, in the rest of the world, I'm worried about refugee camps, uh, about COVID-19 in refugee camps where people are living in cross, uh, close quarters. And, and the uh, food supply issues are acute. Farmers can't get their products to market we're plowing under vegetables, even though they're making huge, the farmers are making huge donations to our, our food banks here in South Florida. The distribution system has broken down. Um, so until we get, and I've always argued, we need a treatment first because in AIDS, 
we never got a vaccine, but we got a treatment pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And it, frankly, it's easier yeah. to make a pill than it is to make a vaccine. So everybody's focused on vaccines. I want a treatment that will save people's lives. Um, let me ask one last question, and then we're going to open it up. I'll remind you how to ask a question. There's a Q&A uh, icon down at the bottom or top of your screen, depending on if you're on an iPad or a, a, um, a computer. You can type it in there. You also can press the participant icon and, quote, raise your hand. If you are on by phone, hit star nine, and that's how you, quote, raise your hand. General Fraser, one of the things that the military does well and uh, I know Representative Shalala has been talking about the military doing a lot of things well, but one of the things is in natural disasters, you step in and you work with the civilian community well. You did that in Haiti. Talk about where the civilian and military do well, because I know uh, Representative Shalala has been talking about, you should take over when it comes to some of the supply chain activity. So give us a little window into your Haiti experience of where you kind of work well together, because maybe this is a moment where we're not calling on the military enough to, to step in and do some things here. Well, from my standpoint, the military is very mission focused. And so you give them a job, you give a mission uh, that they're trained and ready to accomplish and, and, uh, and send them in. And they're very capable and, and very well disciplined to adjust to whatever situations uh, that they found. And that's what I found uh, within the response to Haiti. One, the United States military was not in charge of that operation. It was the U.S. Agency for International Development, was the U.S. Federal Agency in charge uh, of that effort. And so we worked in combination with them, with the State Department, with a lot of international organizations uh, to build the capacity uh, in Haiti to respond and re help them recover, to deal with the situation that we found. The other thing I'll say is that through long-term engagement, and that's not only with militaries and other militaries around the world, but other organizations around the world, uh, we built trust and capability together. And that's critically important when you come to a, a, any kind of disaster response because it, you don't have time to build trust. I can give you all kinds of anecdotes uh, of where and how that happened. The biggest example to me was probably the navies. The navies are very routinely operate with one another and they came together from all over the world off the coast of Haiti and just integrated almost seamlessly in their ability to support the Haitian people. So we'll take some questions, but uh, Representative Shalala, before everybody got on, you were talking, what should the military be doing right now in this moment that you, you would, I know you said it on one of the cable shows uh, last night or the night before I heard you talking about it. I actually think we should have used the military to do all the purchasing of protective equipment as well as masks um, and ventilator, mm -hmm. that we should have done that centrally as a federal role. Number one, they know how to purchase. Uh, and number two, they know how to distribute. Um, uh, they they mm -hmm. literally, that's their skill. And that's a natural role for the federal government. Right now we've got hospitals competing with each other for stuff. We've got the federal government uh, doing some things. We've got the states competing with each other. Miami-Dade ordered some supplies and the feds took it over. It literally outbid them and, uh, and took it over. And uh, we just, we needed one source, one great source in terms of purchasing. And we have the, the law for it, uh, but uh, for some reason the president chose to just leave it to the states. This is one of those things you shouldn't leave to the states because you look to who has the skill level. That's the way you make decisions um, in any kind of a crisis. You look to who has the skill level. And in this case, I think for protective equipment and uh, for ventilators, uh, we literally uh, should have used the military centrally for that. Great answer. All right, I saw a question. I don't know if she's still on, but Betsy Skype. I saw you had um, you you typed it, but did you want to did you want to 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 read your question, Betsy? Do you want to unmute yourself? Let's see if we can get her voice. There she is. Unmute yourself and 
introduce Hi. yourself. There you go, Betsy. Hi, Betsy Skip in Miami. Hello, Congresswoman. Hello, General. And hi, Liz, and everybody out there. Good morning. So um, you addressed one of my concerns, which is food insecurity. It's going to be giant. It already is starting. My other concern was um, the possible loss of all the amazing gains we've made uh, fighting uh, HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and such diseases, preventable diseases. Um, and is there any way to ensure that we won't lose uh, more funding in these programs uh, because of the funding going to COVID-19? You know, I think that we're going to be very careful to protect uh, those investments, particularly the vaccines. Um, and uh, because Deborah Burks is there uh, as the coordinator, she, of course, led our PEPFAR, our big AIDS initiative, and she knows those programs well. So I think the fact that she's working in the White House, she has direct access to the president and to his um, senior staff will be able to protect those, those investments in particular. And most of those are delivered uh, directly through uh, non-governmental organizations or through the UN. So it's a matter of keeping our funding levels up because you can't reduce, uh, the, other, uh, the one thing we don't need is a measles outbreak or a polio outbreak or smallpox or any of these diseases that we have vaccines for or a flu outbreak. I mean, we need to get everybody to get their flu shot uh, this fall as well because we don't wanna mix that with the COVID-19 uh, outbreaks. Um, so I'm going to read a couple questions, and, and here's a question from Stephen uh, Koch, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, who wants to ask a, a similar question, but looking forward. And what's the, what's the energy in Congress to make sure that we pass legislation so that in the future we will be better prepared, kind of my opening question looking at the Bill Gates video, so we'll be better prepared for the next pandemic because the next one could even be worse. We, we all know that all the scientists are telling us that. So what, what's the conversation? You're always at the center of those global health conversations. They're all I looking think, to you. And yeah. I should tell your constituents, Democrats and Republicans, turn to your Congresswoman and ask her what to do. So what are they asking you about that? They're asking me about a readiness. And uh, no one knows readiness better than general than the general, uh, because that's exactly what we've been investing in in the military for a very long period of time. But what he knows is that if you're going to invest in readiness, you can't go up and down in your investments. It has to be more than steady state. You have to ramp up so that you're improving your equipment and the training and all the other pieces. We will have that conversation. We're not really having it now because we're basically ad hocing it, but there will be reviews of why we weren't ready. There will be uh, big uh, commission reports. We did one after 9-11 and no one paid much attention, but this time I'm absolutely convinced that we'll be making strategic investments with the support of military leaders um, around uh, our country because they know the relationship um, between the outbreak of disease and their own uh, readiness. So I think that we'll come together. So far, everything has been bipartisan, though we fight about which programs we wanna fund. I expect this to be bipartisan and, and uh, really to uh, reach consensus, listening to the scientists and to these great public health experts on what we need to do. I'm going to take one that's written and one live. Um, Ambassador Leslie Rowe wants to know about what you think is going to happen to reinstate U.S. funding to WHO. There's obviously tension going on about that. And then I want to call on Steve. I think it's Lou Groff, if I'm pronouncing that right, and, and you're going to be live. So let's, uh, let's hear from uh, Steve. You have to unmute yourself and then, and then on um, Ambassador Rowe. There you go, Steve. You're my, live. My question, Don, uh, Congressman Shalala, it's always nice to see you again. <clears throat> one of my favorite people. Uh, we've worked hard together. Um, in general, I've never met you before, but it's always nice to hear from you. Uh, the, morning, the morning news is absolutely scarier than I have ever heard about the potential increase in the virus. Uh, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people 
where do we go? What do we do? I know we got a president that doesn't give a darn, but we have a lot of Congress people like you that really do. So what do we do? What do we do? You know, we have a lot of political leaders that really do, and I see it as a uh, as a bipartisan issue. I wish we had hit it with a hammer at the beginning. Uh, the general and I were talking about this uh, because his son um, is in uh, South Korea, and they hit it with a hammer. Um, and general, you might talk a little about uh, what you learned from your son about hitting it with a hammer and then doing the follow up. Yeah, so uh, my son has happened to be working in South Korea when, when the pandemic hit South Korea. Uh, and so as uh, the Congresswoman said, uh, the government hit it very, very drastically and very specifically. Uh, so pretty quickly uh, after they started action, my son was, was not quarantined, but he had to stay for a couple of weeks, if I remember right, in his apartment. Uh, and then as they started opening up, he could still work from there, but, but I, they were still working throughout most of, of this time frame. Uh, and when he would go to work, he would have to leave, wear a mask when he was outside his uh, apartment. They would check his temperature when he left the apartment, when he got to work, when he got home from, or when he left work and when he got back. Uh, the government would issue a mask uh, once a month from a local or once a week to a local uh, drugstore. Uh, so, so they've done that, but they also institute a very specific and very uh, big uh, uh, contact tracing uh, program. And, and then they, if they found someone or found a positive case, then that person was isolated while they went and made sure they quarantined uh, the other people. So they, they took very, very deliberate steps to address this topic. Uh, one of my son's coworkers, just to follow up, came into the country because she was outside uh, the country. She was quarantined for 14 days uh, when she came in and she was given a test as soon as she arrived in country. You know, the level of testing, the kind of disciplined organization is what we haven't had. And we're just going to have to put a lot of those pieces in place and probably put in place by governors now and by uh, local government officials. That's the wrong way to do it. It has to be national. We can't have one state doing it one way and another state doing it another way. Um, but we know what to do. And um, we've seen, places like New Zealand and North Korea executed uh, flawlessly. South Korea. South Korea, right. Um, South Korea. Yeah. WHO, WHO, and then I, I want to ask a couple other questions. Uh, WHO, uh, uh, there's WHO. bipartisan support for, uh, 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 for uh, funding WHO. The president will try to move money around. He said he suspended it, but I think our appropriations bill will have appropriate language the last thing you want to do is not fund the one organization that gives you a chance at at, at least uh, advising countries to um, control. And remember here in, uh, here in our country, it's PAHO, it's the Pan American Health Organization that works with Central and, and, uh, uh, and South America. And these organizations are extremely important uh, in controlling uh, COVID-19. So um, Colonel Childers uh, asked the question is, is a question, do you believe that the military takes over a particular mission like distributing food that will make it harder for commercial civilian interests to perform the mission? So how do you get this balance right um, of making sure we use all the different tools that we have? You know, we have, we have we, the, one of the things that I've been really impressed with is watching the private sector step up watching this inspiration of foundations step up, watching nonprofits step up, our governors, as uh, the Congressman was just talking about, step up, state and local step up, and making sure that the military, as, as both of you were suggesting, could do certain mission-driven work, um, but making sure we get that balance right. Um, Congresswoman and, and General, both of you, I'd love your thoughts let, on let that. the General answer that one first. Yeah, from my standpoint, <laughs> okay. it, there doesn't need to be competition. Uh, there is yeah. reality that need, it just needs to be orchestrated and figured out how to do that. And whichever 
organization is the best equipped and best ready to support the mission at the time and the location uh, is probably the best way to do it. And, and so I think there is a relationship that you can develop. It may be that the military supports the rural areas where commercial business supports the urban areas. I don't know the, the right answer because I haven't studied it and looked into it, but I would argue there's a, a, a relationship that's beneficial to both and that both could, uh, could use the benefit. Uh, and, and let me give you just an example of that. Uh, during the response to Haiti, uh, the port was not working. We contracted with a commercial company to provide the capability to open the port. It wasn't a military uh, capability. So I, I see a very easy relationship there uh, if we focus on that and make it happen. And you'll remember, General, that the University of Miami ran the trauma, trauma set up a trauma hospital. They did. Haiti, a good example of the private sector, or a private university at least, uh, working uh, with the military. But we had to get planes in with the equipment. And we actually got volunteers here in Miami, mostly uh, wealthy members of our community who used their small planes because we couldn't land a big plane. Um, to bring our equipment in and to bring the docs and the nurses and the uh, other uh, healthcare personnel. And we were, for a year, we were, um, Operation MedChair uh, was there running the trauma hospital, but we coordinated with the military. Right. Okay, let me ask, uh, one of the things about your background, Congresswoman, is you are one of the early Peace Corps volunteers. And you were in Iran, um, as I understand it, in the early 60s. And obviously all our Peace Corps volunteers have come home. 7,000 have come home. Um, there's lots of conversation about how to get them involved in some wonderful volunteer activities here and, um, and, and hoping we can use them. I know, know many, many of them have, who have come home and obviously are disappointed, uh, but there may be some wonderful opportunities to engage them here. Um, talk a little bit about how that own, your, that own experience impacted your own life, given your complete commitment to international engagement and public service, as well as what you think may be some opportunities to engage those 7,000 wonderful souls that are now back here, disappointed, obviously, they couldn't be around the world, but what, what, what ways we might be able to use them to, to better our, our country right now? Actually, uh, many of my colleagues um, have um, bills that would take advantage of these Peace Corps volunteers as well as other volunteer groups and use them for contact tracing, for example. It's a wonderful mm. program. Uh, it, it takes a limited amount of training uh, for it, but Peace Corps volunteers are perfect for some of those roles. Most of these volunteers really want to go back and finish up their tours. But in the meantime, we certainly have jobs for them as part of our overall effort to contain this virus. Um, so I am enthusiastic about that. For myself, it made me a citizen of the world. I had my 21st birthday in a mud village in southern Iran. Um, and you spend a couple of years uh, working in a mud village um, out, way outside of the big uh, cities, uh, working with people, and it changes it changes your whole world view. And I think that's exactly what John Kennedy wanted to do because he said we would learn more uh, and make uh, our contribution, the contribution would be more in how we viewed the world as much as what we did while we were there. So I am very high on all sorts of national service volunteer activity. Every generation of my family has served in America's military. Um, and that kind of experience, uh, spending a two or three or four years uh, serving your country in a wide variety of ways, I think reshapes all of us and our worldview. And um, that's why I've been a big supporter of national service for a very long time. How do both of you see, play this out just a little bit. The last few questions I wanna ask as we, we come to the top of the hour is what happens next? You're, when do you think you're going back to, to Capitol Hill, to Washington? What do you think is gonna happen? 
um, in terms of getting our country back. We don't know when a vaccine will come. A treatment, as you said, is most is even more important. Um, and, and, and what happens next? What do you hope happens next? What are you calling for happens next? Um, so we can open up our country, but stay safe. General? Well, uh, from my perspective, it, it's very much uh, the routines that uh, people are talking about. The administration has put out a, a list of priorities uh, on how to, to move back through in a phased approach. And I, from my standpoint, we need to encourage all our citizens to be disciplined in that approach uh, so, that, so that we're able to maintain the capacity of, of our health care uh, professionals and everybody else who have been heroes in this situation, help them help us through this uh, pandemic until we're able to get a vaccine that's produced in quantities enough that we can get it across to everybody. I would say, we, yeah, I would say we need a more organized approach. We don't have the level of testing that we need um, to identify uh, to identify people and we certainly you can't do contact tracing until you actually starve the virus way down so that you can follow up on individuals that you identify and we don't have uh, enough personal protective equipment look uh, from my point of view we need to test everybody that works in a grocery store anyone that goes to work needs to go through some kind of a testing regime including checking temperatures um, but we, we have to do a lot more work before we totally open up. I'm not opposed uh, to opening up uh, uh, large spaces like parks as long as people are disciplined uh, about staying away from each other. But some of the other uh, suggestions do not fit in the CDC guidelines. We don't have a state that really meets the CDC guidelines. So starting with testing, and uh, following with, um, uh, with isolation and certainly with contact tracing. Those three things have to be uh, in place before we really uh, open up in large spaces uh, in our country. And it's gonna be very difficult to open up urban uh, areas. We're learning how to work at home, but for millions of people, um, they can't do that. And therefore our strategy, and it's a bipartisan strategy, to basically try to make up a large part of people's payrolls um, so that people are getting, uh, are getting money that they can spend on, um, on rent, on mortgages, as well as on food is really important. Um, so we're putting, going to putting one last question, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. Um, just one last question, two, two last questions and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Is putting you back your old HHS hat on when you think about the speed in which we're trying to get a vaccine and you're watching all your friends in the scientific community, are, are you optimistic that this can be done in the time frame that is being talked about? No, because of the safety um, measures that have to take place. I'm much more optimistic about a treatment. I don't know why we yeah. never got a vaccine for AIDS. In fact, their projections are 2050 to get a vaccine for AIDS but we got a treatment and we saved millions of lives in the process. Yeah. And so we're just beginning to see the breakout on treatments. I think we're gonna get a treatment, two or three different strategies in the next month or so. And I think that that is as critical to opening up as anything else is. But vaccines, look, it's, it's just easier to make a pill than it is to make a vaccine. Vaccines are complicated, though this one won't be as complicated as the AIDS search for a vaccine because this, uh, this disease isn't mutating the way um, AIDS did um, on us. But, but uh, I would have a lot more talk about a treatment so we save lives uh, combined Beautiful. with some That's of the other things we need to do. But you know- That's a really important- even though Everybody's working on it. Uh, as fast as they possibly can for safety's sake. Look what happened when we tried to do, um, uh, when we ha tried to do testing uh, and we put all these tests out um, and we didn't check them. The FDA had to pull back on uh, those specific kinds of tests. So we have to be careful 
that it's got to be safe. And Tony Fauci, the great scientist that we all listen to, is being very careful about saying we've got to make sure it's safe because it could actually be worse than what we currently uh, have. So I know everybody in the world's working at it. There's a huge race, but that's not going to be short term. That's going to be next year. What we really have to do is to find treatments. So let me ask you both to conclude with this question. Um, I, I'm, I'm listening to you and you both have a, a really positive attitude about a lot that we're talking about, even though this is a very, very scary time for, for the world and for your, your constituents and for our neighbors. I, I have, as I said earlier, I, we, we all are inspired when we look at the healthcare workers, when we look at the people we see in the grocery stores, when we see the people who are delivering things to our doorstep, and I can go on and on. And it's true when we see the people who are on the front lines overseas, in the refugee camps, in conflict place, all, literally all over the world. So as you close this session, General, maybe you can start, Congresswoman Fallo, what does give you hope and inspiration as you look at one of our darkest days and certainly our, our recent life? What gives you hope in this moment, General? Well, for, for me, it is uh, the fact that we have uh, a, an international community. Um, mm -hmm. And that international community recognizes that we have an international problem that we're all in this together. And so I think over the long term, it is that focus and that effort. It'll all be fits and starts, but I have great confidence that working internationally uh, with all the different departments of, uh, of the US, as well as all our commercial and citizens, uh, that we will find a way through this. May not be as fast as we would like it to be, but we will find a way through this and, and we can be much better on the other end uh, if we are deliberate about it and we look for, for the opportunities uh, to join uh, together to, to help reduce the opportunities in the future. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for your decades of service to our country. Congresswoman. Thanks, I, I share that view. I, the international community is working together. Uh, people are stepping up um, and we cannot do this without the international community. This is an international disease. This is an international virus. But the fact that, that people are working together, the scientific work that's going on around the world, I'm so happy that they stopped some of the briefings at the White House because I want Tony Fauci to organize the world the way he usually does to search for a vaccine, to search for treatment. But uh, there are no boundaries when you take on something this big, this important, that's life and death. And uh, no matter what we say about international organizations, the people of the world are coming together. And that's what we see. Beautiful to say. So ladies and gentlemen, three quick things to close is one, I, I know if we could all stand up and applaud, you would join me in doing that. So I will do it for you to thank Congresswoman Shalala, General Frazier for their, their leadership, their support, their wonderful words of wisdom today. So thank you both. Second is to continue to thank them. When you hear from us to especially the, your elected officials, they are out there on the front line fighting for us each and every day. And you'll hear from us, you'll hear from my colleagues, Carrie Campbell and Alex Grant, often to share with you what is going on in Washington around these international issues. And when you hear from them, please take the time from your busy schedules to thank them for all that they are doing. We are trying to keep you up to date about what's happening. You can follow us both on our COVID-19 hub you can see it on our website, but also on social media to make sure that you know what's going on. We look forward to working with you and hope that you enjoyed today's conversation, which I certainly learned a lot and hope you did as well. Stay safe and be well and have a great day. Thank you again, both of you for joining us today. Take care, be well. Thanks, General. Hey, great to see you, Congresswoman. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Liz. Bye. Thank you.